What's up, guys? I am James Hake. This is hour four of the Jesse Lee Peterson show on Friday, January 24th, 2020. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it. And shout out to everybody on YouTube.com slash Jesse Lee Peterson one. DLive.tv slash Jesse Lee Peterson. Mixer.com slash JLP Talk. And Periscope.tv slash JLP Talk. Appreciate all you guys hanging in there. And I have a very special guest today. But first, let me just... Give a heads up before I forget, Church with Jesse Lee Peterson is this Sunday and every Sunday, 11 a.m. here in Los Angeles. Go to rebuildingtheman.com slash church. Rebuildingtheman.com is Jesse Lee Peterson's nonprofit bond website. Offer counseling there. You can call 800-411-BOND. Get Jesse's books and all that. Rebuildingtheman.com slash church. And make sure you're subscribed to the bond. Oh, you forgot to change (laughs) change my background. Um, the Bond Rebuilding the Man YouTube channel is an excellent YouTube channel. So, um, we're, <laughs> I, still, I still look like I'm on the Jesse Lee Peterson show, but we'll get that fixed. So, let me get right into this because I have like two hours worth of questions for my guest. And I was supposed to interview him on Monday, but I got major food poisoning. I ate a burrito. We need to deport all burrito makers. But I have with me Richard B. Spencer, president of the National Policy Institute. Um, Nationalpolicy.institute, I think, is the website. He's an author, editor, activist, streaming podcast host. You can find him on YouTube and elsewhere. He's one of the most publicized figures of the alt-right movement in recent years. Three-time guest so far on the Jesse Lee Peterson Show. Um, on Twitter, at Richard B. Spencer, his first interview with Jesse, if you're wondering, was call- titled, Whites Need Identity Politics to Survive. The second one, he takes calls. Jesse asks if he's the head of his wife. Pretty memorable, fun interview. And then the third one was after his uh, University of Florida speech, it, which turned into a riot because the left is and always has been more violent and destructive than the right. Talks about Antifa and forgiving his father. Interesting interviews. So, Richard, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. It's an honor. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad that you survived the burrito incident. Yeah. And uh, that we can talk. Yeah, it, is, it is a bit metaphorical, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> so, first, bef- very important, I want to get this before I forget. A JLP, Jesse Lee Pearson, faithful viewer and moderator named Brandon Johnson says hi to you. <laughs> he said he met you in Hello, Charlottesville. <clears throat> he said he oh, met wow. you in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. I think at the Unite the Right rally, I'm presuming. He's black. Good guy. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, I, th- I think he actually might be another guy. Uh, I think he was there at the uh, a Charlottesville event in May. Okay. I, I remember this uh, person. Yeah, he is a good guy. Yeah, very cool guy. He's a very mm-hmm. faithful viewer. So before I get into like the real interview stuff, please debunk or confirm some Wikipedia smears on you. I personally prefer Info. Oh yeah. I prefer Info Galactic. It's much more sane. I I peeked at their bio of you. It's it's much more uh, sounds more accurate. Do you yeah. openly re- um, embrace the term white supremacists? Just yes or no. no. Okay. No. Are you a neo-Nazi? Uh, I, sorry, you broke up there, but I presume your question was, are you a neo-Nazi? That's correct. <laughs> yes, no, I'm not a neo-Nazi. I've uh, never put on that garb or done all that stuff or said that we need to return to National Socialist Germany or anything like that. So, no. All right. Do you... <laughs> That's two strikes for Wikipedia. Do you advocate for violence against non-whites? No, 
Okay. Uh, I would like anyone to point me to evidence that I ever did that. I know. The, I would, I'm curious. In fact, you're like the object of media promoted violence against whites. Hashtag punch Nazis, anybody? Um, that was a big thing two years ago. Yeah. And yeah, that was an absolutely dangerous situation. That's probably how some people who have know nothing about me know that, that I was attacked, assaulted in the head yeah. by Antifa on uh, Inauguration Day in 2017. Did they ever track down the uh, suspect? No, um, there, you know, 4chan and, and all, you know, the, the internet was doing an investigation and they, they came up with some interesting suspects, right. uh, people who were, uh, truly, uh, degenerate people. Um, but I, I, nothing was ever really confirmed. So I, I, I don't want to, you know, right. uh, jump on any bandwagon, but at some point it doesn't really matter. I mean, Antifa is a big hive horde of violent energy and resentment and drugs and you know weird stuff and uh i don't know they're kind of not actually individuals right <laughs> you know they're <laughs> they're they're just a crazed mob of, of people and and they certainly were incited against me as well so i i don't know the the finding the actual person i mean it, that would be great if that could happen but it it, it doesn't r really matter that much. That's true. I mean, most people get away with their violence, especially on the left, especially when yeah. they're able to wear masks. So, exactly. um, should, should <laughs> here's so a couple more, real fast. Should whites okay. enslave Haitians? <laughs> <laughs> I think that came from a uh, a podcast I did where I, no, I did not advocate slavery. What, okay. what I was basically, um, what I was basically saying is that, um, empires of the past were kind of open with their, you know, domination. They would, they would right. just say, we're going to go take some territory here yeah. and maybe get some resources and slaves to boot. Uh, the, the current kind of interventionary stuff is let's actually go into a country and pour $5 trillion into it and yeah. bring democracy and stay there for 50 years. And I was, I was basically making a rhetorical point where I just, I just kind of prefer the old style of empire kind of more just, let's just kind of, let's just do it, you know, go in and take resources or something that seems a lot more honest and, I don't know, financially efficient than uh, libertarian, you know, uh, liberal humanist right. uh, intervention. That was my point. No, I was not advocating for slaving Haitians. That's complete, you know, nonsense. It's not, you know, it's, it's certainly not going to happen. You know, um, they <clears throat> said that you support ethnic cleansing of um, my racial minorities from the United States and from some other, I guess, a a Turks from some other place. <laughs> I, I got onto a rant one time about how we should uh, retake Constantinople. And oh, nice. uh, yeah, so no, that, that, that was, a, you know, it, it was obviously a, a bit, um, you know, fantastical. But no, I, I do think that that would, that either, I would be confident that the West was the West again, that we were, that we were confident in, our, in ourselves, that we, when we, you know, retake Byzantium and um, uh, Istanbul becomes Constantinople again. So I said this as a, you know, kind of thought experiment. And of course, you know, you can't say, you can't be interesting online. People right. will, you know, then declare that, oh, look, he's advocating for violence or whatever. Well, I mean, um, Joe Biden. But I'm just going to continue to be interesting. You know, I'm going to talk and try to try to try to be provocative in the best sense of the word. Yeah. I'm not going to ever call for violence. Uh, or, or anything like that. And, I, and I'm not going to actually demean other races. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's uh, proper. Uh, but I'm going to continue to be interesting and say things that are provocative. And at this point, I've been smeared to such a degree that one more thing doesn't matter too much. True. <laughs> Joe Biden, you know, he supports so-called peaceful ethnic cleansing of whites into a minority status in the United States. He, does. he thinks it's wonderful. Well, it's funny that I'm attacked, yet all of these people who are treated as, you know, elder statesmen, uh, like Joe Biden, have literally led to the deaths of millions of brown people. I mean, the, the estimate in Iraq is that hundreds of thousands, maybe a million people have either been um, uh, have been killed and more than that have been displaced, injured, had their lives ru ruined. 
and, and so on. And yet I'm the bad guy because I said, let's retake Constantinople, which is obviously a, you know, provocative, you know, let's go get them type thing. <laughs> and, um, yet the people who are actually in charge are treated as, uh, you know, respectable and peaceful individuals. Yet I'm the bad guy. Yeah. You know what? Um, do you support abortion? Um, I, I generally, I, I'm, I generally support abortion rights in the United States. I, I am, I am not pro-life in the way that you would probably define that. Um, how about sterilization? Um, sterilization, um, th this is, we're getting into kind of eugenics questions and, yeah. and, and so on. Um, I, I, I mean, th these are serious issues and we're not anywhere close to this. The eugenics movement was a, a kind of um, American thing. Um, it, uh, people like Madison Grant, Lothrop Stoddard, uh, and others, they were very interested in natural conservation. Uh, they were at, they, they were founders of the national park systems, uh, with the Redwoods Glacier Park, uh, where I am and so on. Um, and they recognize something, uh, that is very serious, which is that natural selection as we knew it is, is not having an effect uh, when it comes to uh, human beings, uh, and that there is going to naturally be a kind of degeneration uh, of of people, and how do we get out of this um, th this problem that is brought on by the industrial revolution, fossil fuel revolution, and uh, and so on, and and then now you know feminism and so on that that we need to. We need to be aware of the problem, which is that we are engaging in dysgenic breeding. That that is the the best people are not having children; yeah. uh, they're foregoing it. Um, and let's just be brutally honest here: some of the worst people who don't care about their kids, who don't want to invest in them, who who aren't, um, you know, the best stock are 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 just you know, uh, uh, breeding like uh, rabbits, and that we need to at least be conscious of this and do something. Um, but yeah, and I'm, I am very concerned with these issues. These might be some of the most controversial issues you can talk about, but it's a very serious thing. Yeah. So is that a no or not necessarily, or what, as far as sterilization itself? Um, I, I think that, uh, it, the, the most humane thing to do would be to, um, offer contraception, uh, for, for people. And there are some, th there are some, you know, systems like a nor plant system or things like that, um, where basically we can allow people to have fruitful, productive lives. Um, but, uh, it, it, it contraception is ob obviously a, a completely humane, uh, thing to do. So the, these are all heady things. These are not all right. policy issues that are going to happen in the next 10 years or so, but, uh, I am at least willing to go there. I'm willing to talk about these things. Um, you know, I want to get to more questions, but I have a, a caller who wants to ask you about an incident from a few years back. So let okay. me get to him. Uh, Steve out of Los Angeles. Steve, you there? Yeah, what's up, Hake? Hey, go for it. Uh, hey, hey, Richard. Um, Hi. Just for, you know, just for the record, I'm a, I'm a supporter. I like your message. I think it's a positive message. It's a pro-human message. I'm all Good. about it. I just wanted to ask you. Um, you said that you, you know, you never associated with neo-Nazism or anything like that, or you never kind of like bared that, that, um, donned that costume. But mm -hmm. I remember a few years back, uh, there was like an incident where there was like some hotel and there was like Tila Tequila and there was like this famous clip of you saying like hail victory, which is like a pretty clear, obvious reference to Nazi Germany. So I just kind of wanted to hear you reconcile those two statements slash events. Sure. Uh, yeah, there, there is a famous photo uh, of a, a party with Tila, Tila Tequila, who's, you know, a, a former reality show star and, and so on, um, basically engaging in some hijinks. I gave a speech in 2016 that, that was a, about 10 days after the election of Donald Trump. And it was a very good speech, um, but the thing that is most remembered about it is the uh, closing lines, uh, which is, um, hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. And it was certainly meant to be provocative. Um, 
I, but at the same time, I don't really regret saying that or, or, and I think it was actually really right in the moment in the sense that obviously, um, hail our people, uh, we, we need to always think about that. This is why we're fighting is for our broader family, our, our community writ large. Um, hail Trump. He just accomplished something absolutely miraculous, something that to be honest, I'm not sure I really believed he could do. Um, hail victory. It should always be about victory. Um, you know, I, I grasp that these things are provocative, but if you can't say uh, them or at least say them in your heart, uh, then you shouldn't be in politics. Uh, it is about politics is ultimately about winning. Uh, and it's a zero sum game in the sense that some, you know, other people, win, we lose, we win, they lose. And so it should be about victory. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so I again, I knew that I was, I knew that I was being extremely provocative. I didn't quite know how provocative I was, right? Uh, but I, uh, I, I certainly don't renounce those sentiments. So, how do you feel, or do, are you aware about mm-hmm. being called the White MLK? We just had MLK Day, Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday. I was supposed to interview that day. Um, right. Were you aware that you were referred to by some as the White? Uh, or MLK, Martin Luther King Jr. for white people? Well, I'll take that as a compliment, uh, actually. Uh, you know, it, I, I think it's worth criticizing Martin Luther King, but I, I, I think it's maybe, uh, maybe more important, maybe a little bit more difficult to see the good things about him. He was undeniably brave. He was much braver than most white activists in the sense that he was willing to go out there and serve time, get beaten up, maybe even be killed, um, uh, as he eventually was. Uh, he was certainly brave. Um, his rhetoric doesn't always appeal to me. Uh, and it was, after all, uh, Republican rhetoric, which he plagiarized, uh, of the, you know, um, black, uh, black children and white children holding hands and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't always appeal to me. But uh, there, there are actually some things about his rhetoric that appeal to me, and um, the and and it's actually that one line that everyone knows, even if they know next to nothing about MLK, and that is, "I have a dream." Uh, he was a visionary, and he wanted to bring a dream into reality. It wasn't about, oh, let's do slow, pragmatic progress, or you know, oh, we want integration, but can we? Do we have a plan to pay for it, or or something like that? No, it was about I have a vision for a better world, and we should bring that into reality, and that is absolutely inspiring. Um, MLK wasn't as interesting to me uh, as a say, critic of society as someone like Malcolm X, um, whom I actually agree with uh, more often. Uh, MLK certainly was supported by the establishment to a very large degree. And at this point, MLK, you know, he's become kind of meaningless. And in the MLK day, the significance of it has faded. I I can remember when I was a kid in in, in the 1980s, I was born in 1978, Um, and you know, obviously I was quite young, but it was a very controversial thing. Should we actually have a national holiday for a non-president, uh, someone who was recently controversial, uh, et cetera, who had, you know, some communist roots and, uh, and so on. And then it became a kind of national holiday. This is the most important day. This expresses who we are as a people. And I think now it's kind of forgotten. I, it's just a long weekend right. for people. And even the left doesn't talk about him. Actually, the right might talk about MLK more, yeah. uh, just in the sense of, we don't want identity politics. MLK was against that. Well, not quite. They're not quite right about that. But uh, whatever. It's kind of become a conservative holiday, and it's forgotten. And the holiday that has uh, surpassed it in length in in celebration, uh, et cetera, is gay rights. Uh, I was actually yeah. in New York City during Pride Month or something, and every uh, the hotel that I was staying in was decked out in rainbow flags. There were rainbow flags everywhere. Every uh, every weekend, there's some new thing. Um, it that has surpassed MLK, and in a in a weird way, I kind of find it sad for Black people. Yeah, who Good who point. have who have certainly 
uh, uh, struggled more, suffered more uh, than gays. And it's not even a question. But the fact is, the gay rights holiday is kind of the perfect holiday uh, for America in the 21st century. Uh, You know, the gay lifestyle is about, I mean, let's be honest. And, you know, obviously, I've, I've known some people who are who are homosexual who are who are perfectly decent i probably know more who are uh nasty individuals if i'm yeah. to be perfectly frank um but what what is the gay lifestyle at the end of the day it's about consumerism it's about not investing in the future, i.e. having children right. and sacrificing yourself for your children. Uh, it's about just being silly, buying a new Coke can with a rainbow flag. It, it's just a it, it's a bunch of silly nonsense uh, at the end of the day. And so it's the perfect holiday for America in the 21st century. Um, you know, we can claim to be leftist and about human liberation, but it's ultimately about capitalism and consumerism and similar nonsense. So back to these his controversial figures. Okay. Um, it was also recently Robert E. Lee's birthday observed, right? And yes. it used to be Lee in some states, Lee Jackson, uh, King day. What's right. your take? What's your take? Very briefly, I know, on General Robert E. Lee. I uh, he was an a- absolute hero and a patriot, uh, a, a man I, I respect uh, tremendously. Uh, he was, he was also, it, it is worth pointing out, someone who reluctantly joined the Southern cause and did it out of a communitarian patriotism of I'm going to fight for Virginia. He was actually offered uh, the reins of the Union Army, but he fought for his home state. So he's he's an absolute hero and a gentleman. Uh, actually, when I lived in um, uh, Alexandria, Virginia, I was not too far away from a church, an Episcopalian church that uh, he attended. Um, uh, the uh, much has changed. The Episcopalian yeah. Church actually has a giant menorah in it, and they have rainbow flags outside and say that everyone's welcome, <laughs> except me, of course. But uh, so uh, it's a yeah, kind of a sad trajectory for my mother church, so, uh, the uh, Episcopal Church. So I have some important stuff that I want to get to mm-hmm. in, in the historical documentary titled "The Big Lie." <laughs> the filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza, I think that was the one oh, that yeah. you appeared in. Yes. Compared you to Democrats. I'll I, take it. I wish Democrats were more like you, to be honest. <laughs> the Democrats are pure evil. They're worse than they were during slavery. They're worse than the Nazis. Um, your only problem that I know of is that you're atheist. You don't maybe necessarily seem that pro-Trump anymore. I don't know. But at I'm least not. you have, like, some respect for the Christians. Democrats don't have any, yeah. or whites, or men, or anything. So, Well, I, I think it's, you know, I, I'm a little bit conflicted about that. I mean, first off, if someone wants to call me a liberal Democrat, then I'll take it. I would <laughs> much prefer that to be, <laughs> to be called literally Hitler. Right. Uh, so, uh, you know, thank you, Dinesh. I, and also, <laughs> I would say that I, I met Dinesh, Dinesh and his wife, and they were... Uh, uh, perfectly nice people and, and respectful. So I, I don't really have anything against him, to be honest. I might disagree with him strongly, but, um, but he, he seems like a good guy. Yeah. But yeah, the, uh, the, you know, in terms of the Democrat Party, I, I guess I'm conflicted about it because there are two, uh, there are kind of three aspects to it. First off, there's the centrist Democrats, maybe represented by Joe Biden, who are basically Republicans and neoconservatives. They go along with all the Republican wars. They're, they're not going to really change anything. They're beholden to build billionaires and they'll talk the talk, but it, it's ultimately the same old crap. Um, there is another aspect of the Democratic Party, which I, I, I think we both agree is exceedingly toxic and disgusting. And that is the woke Democrat Party, which, um, you know, will go along with the Joe Biden stuff, but is absolutely opposed to white males, is absolutely in support of endless mass immigration, uh, is absolutely in support of things that you and I probably couldn't even imagine even yeah. five years ago. I mean, right. like really recently, like uh, we need to uh, have 
you know, federally sponsored surgery for eight year olds who think they're another gender. You know, um, my daughter thinks she's a dinosaur. So, um, I mean, the, you know, <laughs> the, I, well, I, I, I say that just to, to, to point out that right. children are, are inherently kind of confused and conflicted and, and so on. Um, it, that's part of being a kid. It's not a big deal. It's good. You could even say you have to, you have to grow and kind of discover things. And the fact that we would have these crazy doctors who would be willing to perform the surgery. I mean, it's just absolutely shocking. Yeah. And then parents who are basically the the ones, probably more guilty than the doctors, the ones pushing for this, uh, saying, oh, you think you're a boy? Oh, yeah, let's let's have this, you know, irreversible mutilation of your body. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the fact that this is even possible is just absolutely shocking. So I would say, yeah, there is an aspect of the Democratic Party, which is beyond toxic. But, you know, there's another aspect of the Democratic Party that I'm not really opposed to, to be honest. And I think it's Bernie on his best days or Tulsi on his best days, which is basically, um, sorry, phone rang there. Uh, turn off. I apologize there. We have too much technology. Um, <laughs> so the aspect of the Democrat Party, which is kind of Bernie on his best days, uh, which is, you know, we pay more than any other country on health care. And yet people are going people are going bankrupt on health care. People don't have access to it. Um, it premiums are, uh, you know, going, uh, at, you know, out the roof. We, we need to offer some basic things for people, a kind of social Democrat from the mid 20th century. And the fact is, you know, I've been to countries, I've lived in countries like Germany and France. They're pretty civilized. I'm not really opposed to the, the, the best things about the Democratic Party, the, you know, the UBI concept that Andrew Yang brought up, um, uh, Medicare for all, uh, just generally, you know, the Democratic Party is the place where you're able to criticize capitalism and so on. Uh, so I, I think there are some good things. I, I, I don't think it's it's all evil. And um, I, I, you know, it's it's kind of the interesting thing where there, you know, with the Republican Party, you have the some of uh, a, a good message to a degree of family values and traditionalism and, and patriotism and so on uh, mixed up with we support free market capitalism. We support neocon wars and we support all these politicians who are just lie to you all the right. time and talk family values and never do anything. Uh, and then the Democratic Party, you have this. OK, we, we want to give, you know, kids health care. Now we want to help out, you know, working people. We want to help out families. That's all good. But then they mix it in. They in the sandwich. Woke, toxic sludge. And if there's just the, the, the real center is basically a, not really a synthesis, but it, it's breaking up that left right divide. All right. The real center is social conservatism, just normalness, right. you could say, uh, plus things like Medicare for all and just kind of social democracy from Germany in the 1960s. That's the real center. And so we're, we're we are radically polarized, but Actually, on a lot of key issues, there's not a lot of disagreement. Uh, Republic, you know, Medicare for all is popular in the Republican Party. Uh, so if there's someone who could break that left right divide, uh, they could be they could actually make this country pretty livable. But they've got to go against the woke stuff. And they also have to go against a lot of Republican orthodoxy as well. All right. So, um, you were interviewed by Jesse Lee Peterson a few years now, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. What did you think of Jesse's interviews and Jesse Lee Peterson? I'm just curious. Uh, I've always liked Jeff, Jesse Lee Peterson. I, I have, I've listened to him quite often, and he just seems like the kind of guy I would like to uh, have a beer with, so to speak. Uh, he's, he's just a base guy. He's really honest. And uh, I've just always liked him. What did you think of his forgiveness message, his overcoming anger? Do you remember that at all, that stuff? Uh, maybe you could remind me a little bit. Well, his whole thing is men need to become men again by overcoming anger, forgiving their mothers, for returning to their fathers, things along mm -hmm. those lines. That's, that's his primary push, believe it or not. Right. Yeah. 
I, I think that that is generally good. Um, I, I am certainly one who can get uh, controlled by anger a little bit. Um, I'm, I, I might not seem it now. I'm generally an affable guy, but yeah, I, I, I definitely am, am one who, uh, you know, I can get angry at the world. I can get angry at some person who's, you know, I've, I felt betrayed by and so on. And I, I, I've always felt better. I felt energized when you've been able to, you could say, move on or overcome it right on. and, and say, you know, I've made mistakes and I've been wronged. Uh, but I'm moving forward and so on, and, and I'm not drowning in it. And that's always when I uh, feel the healthiest and when I'm most energized and want to go do stuff outside and yeah. and so on. And and I, thought, I think a lot with the kids as well. Like I, I've, over the past six months, um, I won't go into details, but I have gone through a divorce, so you could probably uh, <laughs> yeah. into it what I'm talking about. But yeah, uh, there have been times when I've, you know, wanted to, you know, you know, punch the wall and scream and whatever. Uh, but when you have children, you you have to realize that you've just got to put that aside. You you've got to put it in a box and store it away and maybe deal with it at some point. Because, you know, the fact is anger is natural. I mean, sometimes you should be really angry, uh, but you've just got to store it aside and you can't bring that um, into your relationship with your children. So I, I do think that, you know, have, you know, being part of a family and so on is, is, is a really important thing for health. Um, you know, the millennials, um, and, and, and I, you know, I guess zoomers now who are, who are coming of age, um, are, are radically lonely people. Yeah. And, um, the, some of these statistics, I, I, I found absolutely incredible. The lack of friendship, you have tons of online friends, but <laughs> right. no friends in real life. Uh, the lack of sex, uh, which is interesting, you know, usually old people are like, ah, oh, these young people these days, they're having too much sex. No, it, it's kind of the opposite. And it's a very sad thing. Yeah. It, it's loneliness, um, watching porn as opposed to having, you know, getting in, dating someone or right. not, not to mention marrying them. Uh, and, and I think, uh, a lot of people, when, when you don't have, you know, real life connections, you can kind of drown in your own anger and self pity and rage, uh, and so on. Are you an atheist or agnostic? Well, I, I've described myself as a kind of tragic atheist in the sense that um, I'm, I, I, I don't resonate in the slightest bit with the happy atheism right. of people like Richard Dawkins and uh, Peter Hitchens, who are not Peter Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, uh -huh. uh, Peter Hitchens, uh, character of a totally different color, his brother, um, Christopher Hitchens and so on, where it's, oh, we just need to give up on God and then everyone will be liberal individualist, you know, gay pride <laughs> parade attendees or, or something. I, I've never bought into that uh, in the slightest bit. Uh, I do think that since uh, at the very least the 19th century, I uh, Europeans, white people have been undergoing a, a, a spiritual crisis. This isn't something that derives from the 1990s or something. This is a long-term spiritual crisis that Nietzsche uh, codified as, as God is dead. Nietzsche was not claiming he's, we killed God, um, and we need to reconcile with deicide with this spiritual catastrophe and our listlessness uh, in the world. And so I, I've, I, I guess I, I, I recognize that, but I'm not someone who thinks that, you know, atheism is somehow good um, or that we're going to, you know, the world is going to be happier that way. I, right. I think that civilizations need a spiritual core. Uh, individuals need a spiritual core. Uh, and if we lack uh, a spirituality that unites us, uh, the white race will, uh, uh, it might survive, but it, it won't survive in a, in a happy, productive, uh, or flourishing state. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that's how I would describe myself. I recognize the, the spiritual crisis that we're go that we were undergoing. Um, but I also recognize the, the need for public religion. I don't think that there's really a separation of church and state, and that's not a historical, uh, not, not only is that perhaps not exactly what the founders meant, maybe Jefferson kind of meant it, but uh, that's 
that, 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 that's an ahistorical way of looking at religion. Actually, uh, religion is public. Religion isn't just something you do in private. You can read a book by Marianne Williamson in private and <laughs> get the feels and the, you know, the, have a little, you know, emotion in your tummy about, you know, spirituality and crystals and whatever. But um, real religion is public. It is about being in a community of believers, and it is ultimately about believing in yourself as a people uh, with a God in some way as a, a symbol of your power. Uh, and so we need that. We've evolved to be religious. Um, that is who we are. And the uh, the, the peoples or civilizations or states uh, that have that religious basis are going to dominate the world, and the little atheist individuals are going to lose out. Uh, so that those are my feelings. It's a very interesting. I'll just do a quick plug here. Okay. Um, I'm actually publishing a book in February. Uh, it's at the printers right now, but it's called um, "Why Islam Makes You Stupid, But Also Means You'll Conquer." Uh, but it also means <laughs> to conquer the world. <laughs> And, uh, about this very issue, he looks at Islam critically and recognizes that it does kind of make you stupid. It suffocates critical and creative thinking. Uh, there are other aspects to the, the dogma of, you know, um, uh, uh, genital mutilation and, and constant praying and fasting and so on that, that are actually uh, bad for your intellectual health, you could say. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it is people who follow a faith like Islam who will ultimately dominate the world uh, in the sense that Islam makes you more ethnocentric. Uh, it makes you believe in yourself more. It gives you a fire uh, that atheism and liberal humanism never could. So it's a, it's a kind of, you could say, ambivalent book, and I think it's going to be very thought-provoking. Interesting. Who is the author? I think it, you broke up. When you were mentioning him, Edward Dutton. Yeah, okay. Edward Dutton. So, yeah, Edward Dutton. Were you raised Christian? Were you raised Christian? Uh, more or less, I was raised. Yes, more or less, I was uh, raised Episcopalian. Whether okay. you consider that Christian or not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I noticed that, like with this um, embracing your race as your extended family, I noticed that blacks do this but they don't have their own families together and they so they reject mm. family they reject their fathers definitely um and embrace race and gangs as like an as like a placeholder for that lack of family and original love that they were supposed to have it seems like hmm anyways that's just a side note um you said that christianity was a reflection of who we are as white people. So is Jesse Lee Peterson right when he says that he is white on the inside, black on the outside? <laughs> he kind of is right. Uh, maybe that's why, why I like him. I would never uh, insult him by calling him an Oreo, so to speak. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I think there's a, a bit of a bit of truth there. It's funny that he says that himself. <laughs> So um, I, I wish all blacks were like Jesse Lee Peterson. Uh, I, I truly do. There yeah. would be very few racial issues. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, so I think I recall Ann Coulter once criticizing you. Mm -hmm. I think I remember her saying something along the lines of criticizing you as like a media whore, which may be my, uh, my harsh paraphrase. I, I, and sure. I could be totally misremembering it so apologies to no I, I think i've seen her say things like that yeah until that, that's generally the conservative that's generally the conservative line and she is still connected with that yeah. which is that um you know we've been ignoring spencer for a decade uh <laughs> but it's the liberal media that uh, that promoted him and so on uh i don't uh i, I don't regret uh basically t talking to the media in the sense that it was a it it, it they were do they were playing their own game, which I acknowledge, which in 2016 to 2017 was, oh, let's bash Trump by connecting him with this, you know, Richard 
right. Spencer, this, you know, wild theorist and so on. Um, but I think on another level, they were actually interested in what I was saying, to be honest. And uh, but it was also a a great way to get the message out. Uh, now, the media can turn on you and the media starts to create smears and cringe videos and so on. So it's, right. it's a dangerous game to play. Uh, but, uh, the fact is, uh, I have been ignored and attacked by conservatives for a decade. Um, I, I remember when I first created alternative right.com and, uh, John Darbyshire actually mentioned something on national review. He was immediately rebuked and, uh, censored and so on. So conservatives basically want to ignore this kind of thing. Conservatives are always punching right. So to speak, they want to be the most, extreme or radical thing out there and they don't <laughs> want anything stealing their thunder they don't want anything criticizing them and so on so i i don't have much love for conservatives i agree with ann coulter a lot of the time but you know ann coulter has been wrong most of the time and uh this i i think there's a tendency among you know trumpist and and harder core conservatives where they're now talking about things like we've got to get tough on immigration and, you know, demographics or an issue and all this kind of stuff. Uh, this is the kind of thing they should have been talking about in the nineties, yeah, uh, but they weren't. And we're now at a very, or in the eighties, um, we're now in a very different place and we now need to move forward. Not so much talking about, you know, poor immigrants are going to ruin America or something, which isn't exactly true. We could go into that, but we need to be talking about our own identity and not just uh, assuming these things or ignoring them. Uh, so I, I think we need to move beyond this. And the fact that, you know, Ann Coulter kind of sounds like Peter Brimelow from 25 years ago, uh, I, I, I kind of find, I don't know, Right. Uh, a little bit wrong. And then beyond <laughs> that, it's like what I hear from a lot of them now is Trump needs to talk about immigration more. He needs to talk about it in 2020 when we can win. Well, you know, he should have done something about immigration. He should have, as opposed to doing this terrible health care plan, uh, he should have focused on changing the immigration, legal immigration paradigm in 2017 and just spent his political capital on the things that really mattered. But he didn't. And now he doesn't have Congress. After 2020, he probably won't have the Senate. And so that window has closed. They had a moment, the kind of, you know, mainstream immigration restrictionist groups, they had their moment and it's passed and we need to start moving on. I don't want to be in a situation where Republicans, whether it's Trump or in 2024, Nikki Haley or oh, Lindsey man. Graham or whoever's going to run. No. Uh, are just going to basically lie to us about immigration and start being like, well, we've got to start, we've got to get tough on this stuff, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's all rhetoric. It's all BS. And I'm basically sick of it. Uh, yeah. I want, I want us to actually get real, but, but I also think that we need to be thinking about what's going to be relevant in the future. Um, immigration, the, the demographic change is baked into the cake. Uh, as of 2012, I believe, uh, the majority of births in the United States were to non-white mothers. So, you know, this, you know, th there was that 2050 number uh, from some time ago of uh, that Bill Clinton announced in the late 90s. By 2050, America, white, th there'll be no majority in America. Whites will be a minority among many. Uh, it's now at 2040. Uh, it might actually be sooner than that in the mid 2030s. Uh, so this is happening, and we need to think about how we're going to deal with this reality, with a multicultural, multiracial reality in which whites are hated in the United States. Yeah. We're going to have to deal with that and just kind of race baiting on immigration so that Republicans can hang on to a majority just doesn't interest me in the slightest. Um, you know, until your interviews with Jesse Lee Peterson, all I had seen was your interviews in the a couple of interviews in the media. And so I had agreed with Ann right. Coulter. I'm like, ah, I, I disagreed with uh, Dylan, who was then my intern. Um, that huh. I mean, he, he was then my intern. Now he's like my kind of de facto producer. Um, mm -hmm. I thought the same. I thought that you were kind of like a media whore. But now I, I see your cause as white unity. Has your ego ever hurt that cause? 
Uh, of course. I mean, uh, look, uh, I'm pretty self-confident and I think highly of myself. I can admit <laughs> that. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I don't know what to say to people who criticize me for having an ego. Uh, I think most people who do this have an ego. You've got to have an ego at some point if you're going to put yourself forward, if you're going to enter the, the forum. It's like saying, you know, gosh, you know, Troy Aikman, um, his ego really got in the way of him being <laughs> a Super Bowl champion quarterback. Well, did it or is the mere fact that he was willing to, you know, risk his life to go on the football field and win and lead the troops and criticize people when they needed to be criticized. That's you have to have a big ego to do it. And, you know, much like a great hero has to have a little bit of a self-destructive side to him. Yeah. A, a great hero has to put aside mundane concerns and risk something and maybe fail in order to become a hero. Uh, so I, I just, you know, I, 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 I get it. I think maybe, you know, if someone's a bit narcissistic, that can be a problem. You know, do, uh, am I a perfect person? <laughs> no. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to enter the forum, you're probably going to be an arrogant jerk. And that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> so my de facto producer, Dylan, is a fan of both you and Ann Coulter. He even uh -huh. named his cat Spencer. You may recall that from... I Jason's. remember that. I was... People yes, started calling him. Pe people started calling him, and this is, might be a little bit uh, Chaggit for it, <laughs> because he's a Chad, a good-looking guy, and yeah, he's uh -huh. such a fan of like another man. But he does have a. Oh. He has a girlfriend. <laughs> he's not <laughs> okay. gay. Um, he says that you look like you should be in a white nationalist boy band, the Fash Street Boys. Does that exist already or something? The Fash. <laughs> Street Boys. Well, it, it, if it were to ever exist, I would. Yes. So uh, there's some funny uh, there's some funny videos of me singing karaoke. So uh, <laughs> yes, I, I would join such a band. Are you? That would be a lot of fun. I hope I'm not too old. <laughs> are you a genuine person? I think I am a genuine person, and you know, the things that have gotten me in the most trouble have been my honesty. Uh, I tell it like it is. And I don't, I also don't play games and I don't try to speak to the crowd. There, there are a lot of people in my movement who I would criticize for just kind of going along, going with the flow. Basically, they, they read the room of their chat forum or whatever, and they just kind of repeat back to them what they want to hear. I actually tell them what they need to hear, not necessarily what they want to hear. And uh, most of all problems in my life have resulted from my brutal honesty. Uh, so I, I, I think that if you just look at, you know, look at my actions and how I've behaved, um, I've, I've suffered due to the fact that I'm quite genuine. Yeah. Uh, but I am who I am. I'm not doing this. Uh, I, I, if I were, if I had simply gone to law school or whatever, sold real estate or, or, whatever, uh, gone into corporate America, uh, I could be, uh, sitting pretty right now. Um, I had that background, I had that educational basis, uh, but I didn't. And I think that's the sign of a genuine person. Um, this might sound out of left field. Do you share my admiration and respect for Bill O'Reilly? No. No? <laughs> okay. Not at all. That's all right. <laughs> Many people don't. All right. Many and and people that I like don't. Anyway, I was just yeah. curious. Um, I've heard many on the right and many people. Period. Talk crap for lack of better vocabulary, right? About you. Yeah. But I haven't really seen you respond in kind, except maybe about Trump on Twitter a little. But generally, I have noticed that. Many of them, I would think that you would get along with. Um, any, well, I don't know. In any word for your critics? You on can the name right? names. I'm, I'm not really interested in naming the names, but any word okay. for your critics on the right, generally, in brief? Uh, I, I think you might care more about me than I care <laughs> about you. Okay. I'm sorry to say. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I'll talk a little, you know what, here and there. Uh-huh. Um, locker room talk, I guess, as it goes. Uh, but when I criticize someone, uh, I want to seriously criticize them in the sense that I want to, in a way, give them the respect that they're due. I'm criticizing you because I think that what you're doing is kind of wrong, but also importantly wrong. And uh, so, yeah, that that's why I would criticize someone is if they are significant in some way. Uh, but yeah, the, the kind of, I, you know, I don't want to engage in self pity, but yeah, when the, the amount of trash that is thrown my way and kind of contradictory trash as well, like I, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm CIA or (laughs) I'm gay or I'm a crazy neo-Nazi or I'm fat. I've seen that. I'm, I do (laughs) cocaine. I, I, I've seen all of this, um, you know, it, it's all this kind of contradictory garbage that's just thrown up against the wall to see what sticks. I get a lot of it. Um, and at this point, I have skin like an elephant. Right on. Or rhinoceros, what was the right? Do well, you have... Doesn't bother me. Do you have self-control? I do have self-control, but I also have passion. And uh, so, you know, when I'm on something like this, uh, I'm laid back and so on, uh, I can certainly have my heated moments. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't confuse self-control with being boring (laughs) and not having guts. You know, there's sometimes a time to call it like it is. There's sometimes a time to rally the troops. There's sometimes a time to get angry. And uh, I, I, I think the real, the real question, I, I think a better question is, does someone have passion? And pa- the ancients thought passion was a great virtue. Uh, I think we now kind of see, pa- you know, it's like, why are you mad, bro, or whatever? You know, we, we, right. we, we now see passion as a liability. The ancients did not see passion as a liability. Uh, passion is about connecting to the real. It's about connecting to... Uh, what it means to be a human being. And I certainly have passion. And uh, I'm not going to apologize for that. A year or two ago, I interviewed Christopher Cantwell, and he's, they've been coming down on him hard. And I hear that he was yep. arrested just recently on federal charges, supposedly threatening or whatever, um, somebody out of state. I saw that. Any thoughts on Christopher Cantwell, just in general, brief, briefly? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, Cantwell was an interesting figure. Excuse me. Um, I, uh, I met him a couple of times. I was certainly never friends with him. But he came from the libertarian. Yeah. He came from the kind of right wing Ron Paul libertarianism into the alt right. And I thought that was a productive phenomenon. Um, but he, he was a, a kind of a, a bit of a strange guy. Um, he, you know, certainly is passionate yeah. about things, but um, not exactly the, the, the kind of guy I would want to be, you know, colleagues with. But um, something did happen in, in Charlottesville. I mean, in 2017, uh, I, I saw him a bit when I was at the Unite the Right rally. And yeah, I mean, he, he was on a level of adrenaline that was... Uh, a bit much. And uh, then afterward, he's done a lot of dirty tricks. Uh, I think he's felt betrayed and rejected by the movement. And, and I feel that way, too, to a degree. Yeah. Uh, but he's kind of responded with uh, nastiness. Uh, but I, I did see that thing. It, it seemed like he sent out a nasty message in order to get information. So I'm not sure I would really classify that as a threat. It, seem, it seems like a yeah. You know, threatening rape, that's a very serious charge where it's like, I am going to do this to you right now. Just saying something on the Internet, I, I think, might just be a, a bunch of hot air. Yeah. But nevertheless, he was trying to ex- uh, extract information, which sounds pretty sketchy. So I, I just I'm not sure there's any I'm not I'm not sure there's any good side on this issue, to be honest. Um, he, he's it, 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 it's it's the guy's a bit of a tragedy, but then from the very beginning, he had a lot of problems, um, including some, you know, a self-admitted uh, kind of use of drugs and, and, and things like that. So I, you know, 
I, I, I at some level kind of feel for him as a, as a human, but, um, uh, yeah, there it is. It's a tough case. I hear that you're not necessarily with the, the Groiper war, the America first movement, which I take to me, like I take their movement to be about Christian morality, confront the rhinos or neocons, whatever you want to call them, stop the immigration, no Israel wars. In two sentences or less, what's your critique of the America first slash Groypers? Is it personal? Is it the Catholic Christian thing? Are they immature? Is it Wexit? Do we need to get out of the Republican Party or what is it? <laughs> I, I think they are immature, but I think the, the major problem with them was, you could say, strategic or ideological. They were wearing Trump hats and claiming to speak on behalf of Donald Trump and what they're doing. And they're ultimately going to all vote for Donald Trump. Uh, the fact is, Donald Trump has pursued the Paul Ryan, Charlie Kirk agenda. And so I, I, I think the whole thing, I think it was good to a, to a degree, but I think the whole thing was fundamentally delusional and is just about, I don't know, being a Catholic racist Republican. And I'm not <laughs> interested in that. Um, even though, okay, let me, let me get right to this. Um, this is a question that I got from a, from a guy. You told Roland Martin, the, white, the black dude, um, that you don't want whites to rule over other races. Yeah. But on Mark Collette, you said you do want whites to rule. On the kill stream, shout out to the Ralph Retort uh, the other day. You said that we should, and I don't know if you mean just we, whites, uh, we should be telling what people what to do. Maybe you meant America. Um, if we don't run the world, someone else will. So is that a change from the Roland Martin interview to Mark Collette and kill stream? Uh, there, there might be a little bit of a change in my thinking. Um, I, I do think that the world is a better place uh, if we were hegemonic. Um, we, in a way, live now in a white-led world, but it's the worst whites, and we're <laughs> taking all cultures down with us. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, and again, I, I've, I've heard things, you know, it's like illegal immigrants have all this power and, and, um, you know, blacks have all this power. It's, you know, look guys, it's ultimately liberal white people who are doing this. Um, and the, you know, the, they are the ones with the actual power. Now, whether that will last, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I would stand behind my statement, which is uh, effectively it's a kind of Machiavellian point of if we don't do it, someone else will. Yeah. There are other people who want to rule the world. Uh, the, the, the Chinese have a vision of what they want. At this point, they're actually economically integrated into the American world. Uh, but they certainly have a vision of what a world led by them would look like, and I don't want that. I think it might be preferable to other things, and I don't have any you know, animosity towards the Chinese, but I do not want to live in that. Certainly Islam has a view of what it would be like if, we ran, if they ran the world. Uh, that is something, you know, Edward Dutton's book aside, that is something that I absolutely do not want to experience. Uh, so we, I don't think we should retreat in into this petty nationalism of, you know, oh, I just want my little country here. And, uh, you know, everything would be fine if we just stayed in our own yards. Uh, that's never going to happen. And those little nationalist countries that people get excited about, like Hungary or Poland, are ultimately integrated into a NATO-led military empire. Yeah. Um, and they aren't truly independent and sovereign um, in, in the way that th those terms should be defined. Uh, so the question, you know, so the issue is someone will predominate, someone will project power geopolitically. Who's it going to be? All, all these little nation states aren't going to do it. They don't have militaries, not to mention nuclear weapons, and they don't have a, a unifying vision for the world like Islam, like Americanism to kind of give the devil his due. Uh, Americanism is fading. It's losing legitimacy. But the American-led order did have something to it. Um, after the Second World War, it had a tremendous amount of, you could say, social capital or soft power, where being Shit. like America was viewed as a great thing. Um, it was something that people wanted to be a part of. They wanted to be under the boot of Uncle Sam, you could say. 
Um, it's now losing that legitimacy due to terrible foreign policy decisions, due to Zionism, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it was something. It was a global ideology. And I do think that we're going to need that. We're never going to actually move away from globalism. Uh, you know, it, it's it's the, the people were talking about, you know, a united Europe or a, a, a one planet in the age of trains and the telegraph and the telephone and so on. Now we're in the age of the Internet and more. There's always going to be a kind of global consciousness where we are thinking about what's happening elsewhere around the world and so on. And so there 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 are going to be these big and and there are going to be these big military blocks that project power on a geopolitical scale we have to recognize that reality and not just you know retreat into the kind of comfort food of nationalism i got gotcha. you so i'm out of time but i have a, one last question do you want trump to win sure. or lose in 2020 I don't want him to win. Wow. Uh, because I don't want any more lies. <laughs> I don't want to be lied to. I, I would actually Well, I would I would almost prefer uh, I, I first off, I, I have some respect for Bernie Sanders. I think he's authentic. Uh, but I would almost prefer an open communist to a lying conservative who's not gonna actually do anything. Dang. Uh, because an, an open communist would make things clear. Uh, it would it would set the battle lines with Trump. It's all about delusion and and thinking that we're winning when we're clearly losing and so on. I, I don't want him to win again. I, I've seen enough <laughs> and I don't think he will win as well. I think he will lose. Wow. Although I'm kind of we'll see what happens. This a Bernie versus Bloomberg versus Trump might be fascinating. And uh, I think Bloomberg might even take more from the Democrats than he would take from the Republicans. So I could see Trump winning. There, there is a path to victory, but I, I ultimately don't want him to win. Wow. Well, I appreciate you talking with me. I loved talking with you, uh, and I wish you well, Richard. <laughs> take care. Richard Spencer. Likewise. I wish you well. All right. All right, guys. Make sure you tune in to Church with Jesse Lee Peterson, rebuildingtheman.com slash church Sunday, every Sunday, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Standard Time. Well, during our standard time, when it's daylight time, it's, it's Pacific Daylight Time. Rebuildingtheman.com slash church. And uh, that was Richard Spencer, at Richard B. Spencer on Twitter. He's still on Twitter. But um, all right, guys. Um, is there the fallen state today? Look out for a new fallen state this week, t this today, noon, Re um, thefallenstate.tv. All right, guys, take care.